Thank you for joining us on another edition of Against the Current, coming to you live from downtown Chicago, atop the Old Republic Building at the Skyline Club. My guest on this edition of Against the Current is Illinois State Comptroller Leslie Munger. Leslie, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. And I also appreciate that you let us call you Leslie, and we don't have to <laughs> always use your formal political title. It's, 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 it's a nice thing. It's a little bit, you know, anti-ruling class. So we appreciate that. Um, so just a little bit of backstory before we get into, you know, the, the what besets your every day, which is the state budget and trying to pay bills, uh, particularly since we don't have enough money for all the bills that we have. Uh, but you have a, uh, had a successful career in corporate America. I did. Uh, raised two boys, went off to college. They're on their way now. You got a husband who's a successful intellectual property attorney. And then in 2014, for some reason, you decided to run for state representative. You lost a very close race in, a suburb in Lake County where, where you reside. And then uh, that was not enough punishment. Uh, then you <laughs> subsequently took the appointment to be Illinois State Comptroller. You should have been on Mediterranean cruises with your husband, John, after your career, but you chose to run for state rep. Then you should have gone on the Mediterranean cruises, but you chose to take the appointment for Illinois State Comptroller. Why? I'm a lifelong Illinoisan, and uh, I just want to see our state do better. And it really, the impetus for me was back when my older son graduated from college, U of I engineer, honors, uh, honor student, leader, minor in business, all these things. I thought, he's for sure going to get a job in Illinois. He looked for jobs for a long time. He ended up actually having to move out of state. A lot of great job offers out of state. Uh, but not so many in-state. And driving him down to Texas, where he took his first job, was really a wake-up call to me. And I thought, people who can, people who can do something, have to step up and try and take back our state. And it was really what led me to decide to run for state rep. And I worked as hard as I could <laughs> for as long as I could, came pretty close. And uh, as you already noted, uh, not quite close enough and really was just getting back to my nice life. I put my credentials into the governor's transition team thinking maybe I can help somewhere. Uh, really thought maybe I'd be a, a trustee at U of I since my husband and both of our sons and I are all U of I alums. And uh, then the call came from the governor's staff right after the first of the year. I'll tell you, never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be sitting here as the comptroller. But when the governor calls and asks you to step up and help, you can't really say no. And I feel really grateful that he asked me to to help at this time in the state. I think my business skills and the background I have in social service is a really good mix of things to help the state right now. Well, and so distinguish between your uh, decades in corporate America and the varied job responsibilities and skill sets that were required to be successful in corporate America, and then what you've experienced in your time as, as comptroller and where there are some similarities, some fungible skill sets, and where maybe you needed to develop new skill sets that you didn't have because you didn't need them in the corporate sector. You know, interestingly, for my office of comptroller, there's a lot of similarities between the corporate side and what we do now. Uh, I'm responsible for the state's checkbook. So all of my background in finance, in managing budgets, in having to look for ways to save money, uh, to deliver results for, or expectations for my company financial expectations, uh, while still getting the job done. A lot of times we had to cut costs and still get the job done. Similar things to what I've done in my own office as comptroller. Uh, in, in my office, I cut my own budget 10%. And I still, you know, I think arguably we're in the most challenging year we've ever had in the state. Uh, I have to manage a large staff uh, with the, in the comptroller's office. I have 219 people on my staff. I had to manage a large staff when I worked uh, in my years in corporate America, and particularly at Helene Curtis. So there's a lot of similarities. Probably the biggest difference is that in the state, uh, in, in business, you know you have a problem. You get everybody around a table. You say, this is the problem. This is our goal. This is what we have to do. Everybody puts in their best ideas. You figure out what you're going to do, and you move forward. The state does not work that way, uh, as I think everybody's probably seen first uh, f firsthand this last year. I, I assume Haley Curtis is a little bit more bottom line sensitive than the state of Illinois. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, you're not allowed to allow, uh, to have $10 billion in bills go unpaid and not be resourced to be paid. No, there was never a time when we did not meet our budgets. Even if our sales did not meet what they were supposed to be, then we were cutting budgets and we still had to deliver our goals. Mm -hmm. And if another part of the company didn't do well, and it, you know, it didn't matter. It was my problem. I still had to help come up with extra money, so we made our shareholders' expectations. So uh, in the state, there just is no accountability. And um, 
people who they, they make decisions and it doesn't matter whether they're good or bad decisions. Those same people get elected over and over again. Uh, there's no willingness, no sense of urgency to sit down and really attack the problem and, and look for a long-term solution. Everyone's more worried about maintaining their political careers. And so that's really the biggest difference. We don't solve the problem. We see people really doing a short-term band-aid, how do I get myself to the next election kind of a fix, instead of really uh, looking at a long-term solution to get on a better track. So that's describing a little bit of the uh, corporate culture, if you will, in state government, the, uh, a kleptocratic one I would describe. Uh, and I think that was uh, illustrated rather nicely recently by State Senator Kimberly Lightford, who's uh, from West Central Cook County. And uh, again, Ten billion dollars is what where we're tracking in terms of unpaid state bills. Is that a rough number? Is that correct? That's about right. Yes. Um, we're at eight currently, but we have more coming in. We think we'll be at ten by the end of the calendar year. And so we're talking about social service providers, mm -hmm. state vendors, people that have provided goods or services to the state, held up mm -hmm. their end of the bargain. The state doesn't have the resources to hold up its end of the bargain, or at least not in terms of a reasonable turnaround, reasonable right. billing cycle. And Kimberly Lightfoot stands up uh, and in the Senate floor and says, you know, Comptroller Munger, um, we worked, we want our paychecks. We shouldn't be, essentially, she said, we shouldn't be in the queue with social service providers or uh, private sector companies that provide goods or services to the state. We should be at the front of the queue getting paid first because, frankly, in no uncertain terms, I want my money. Right. And so, you know, what's the response in terms of uh, should legislators be at the front of the queue, making sure they get paid first and foremost, or should they be in line uh, like everybody else? And, pr and frankly, since uh, you could, I think, pretty persuasively argue there's been a bit of an abrogation of their duty, maybe all the way at the end of that line. Well, that uh, little discussion of hers in the floor of the Senate was illuminating, wasn't it? Uh, it really, I think, sheds a lot of light on the attitude that a lot of people have down there. I, um, I made the decision back in April to put all of the elected, off, elected official pay in line. It includes all constitutional officers, including my own pay, and the 177 members of the General Assembly. Uh, and I um, put the bill, the, the payroll in line with the rest of the state's bills. I did that because under the law, I'm obligated to make payments, make that payroll payment every single month. It was a law passed by the General Assembly back in 2013 that even if we didn't have a budget in place, they were going to make sure they got paid. Well, and this so, is when a gov uh, previous Governor Quinn yes. tried to not pay them, and so they remedied that to make sure they right. get their pay. And and it's important because a lot of people probably listen to this and they say, well, you know, we should be more punitive. They shouldn't get paid at all right. until there's a budget, until everybody else is paid first, then they should get paid. Well, you can't do that under the law. Right. Governor Quinn was taken to court, and the court ordered him to make a payment and so by law I have to run the payroll every month uh, but the other thing I need is the comptroller to make payments with is money and we're pretty <laughs> clear we're out of money and so um, I really uh, the more I traveled around the state talking to social service organizations looking at the devastation of promises made but not funded for many years I thought you know I how can I do something to help here I felt it was wrong for me to be paid uh, when all of the people whose salaries pay the taxes to fund our paychecks. We're, we're waiting in line for, for months to get paid, and in some cases, some of them didn't get paid all of last year with no budget. And it, it really, it took me a little while to figure out how I could follow the law and uh, not pay them on time and put them all, but we, by putting them in line with the state's bills, I think it's a great way to comply with the law, puts us all on an even footing. It's about fundamentally fair, being fair, and uh, having us all walk in the same shoes. And I will tell you, it has been an eye-opener for a lot of the legislators who call me, uh, both sides of the aisle, frankly, I've heard from that are worried about how long it's going to be before they get a paycheck. And I remind them, at least they still have a job. Yeah. And um, Welcome to the party. Yeah, this, is, this has been going on for a long time. And we'll all get paid on time when we get our backlog of bills down to a normal amount that gets paid in 30 days. Well, and, and speaking of this, you know, part of your challenge I suspect, and it's the challenge just inherent to the office, is communicating what the comptroller does, what the comptroller can and can't do under right. the law, and also just this kind of large amorphous thing called the state budget, whether it's a stopgap budget, whether it's a constitutionally balanced state budget that we had sometime just after the state was incorporated and haven't <laughs> seen since. Uh, 
but but you, you've tried to kind of drill this down in such a way that's understandable so people can appreciate you you just because people make demands that doesn't create new money for the controller or for the state right. for the controller to distribute and you've tried to kind of drill this down into a, a household analogy so people can understand the financial pressures you're under to prioritize and to kind of keep the household together mm -hmm. while you don't have enough resources to pay all of the obligations that have been imposed on the household. So g give us that example because it's a, an internet, it's a meme that's yeah. kind of now gone viral on the internet because it's an easy way for people to understand exactly where Illinois finds itself uh, financially. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it was interesting because I, I can't vote in the legislature. I can't force the governor to do something. Uh, so I have my hands tied as the comptroller and what I can actually do to help this mess, but I can be an educator. And so I started going around, traveling around, taking the state budget issues all around the state. And invariably, I would talk about how we had, at the at the time, and actually I apply these currently, we have about $8 billion worth of unpaid bills in the state. Uh, for a long time, we had a large unfunded chunk of our government that was an, about another $2 billion that we were accruing. We have unfunded pension liabilities of over $116 billion. I would take these numbers around and explain this to people and say, we have, on average, every day in the state, about $100 million to pay our bills with. And then somebody would raise their hand and say, uh, well, why can't you pay this? And when are you going to be able to pay that? And it, it really became very clear to me quickly that these numbers are so big, nobody can wrap their heads around the magnitude of the problems that the, the state faces every single day with cash flow. Right, and a hundred million dollars sounds a like a lot of money. Right, sounds like it's uh, a lot of my money. priorities could be your priorities if I just lobbied you for exactly. it. Exactly. Right? So um, I started taking. I looked for a way to get this down to something we could all understand in our own home. So I started taking six zeros off of all the numbers. So, and then I say, imagine if you sat down at your own kitchen table to pay your bills, you'd look in your checkbook, you would see that you had $100 because if you take six zeros off of 100 million, you have $100. Then you would be looking at a pile of bills sitting right before that you had to pay right now that would be over $8,000. Now, you knew you'd spent more money. In fact, those bills just showed up in your mailbox because we just passed a stopgap budget a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we haven't even opened those bills yet. But we know we have about another $1,500 worth of bills that we are going to have to pay as soon as we get those bills open and add them to the pile. And if we open up our credit card statement and look at what we owe in our unfunded pension liability that we as a state make a monthly contribution or payment on, so we'd have to make a monthly payment, we would be looking at a bill of over $116,000. And we have $100. You know, are, are any of us going to look at that $100 and think we have any more money to spend? Or we think, oh, it's time for a trip to the mall, which is sort of the attitude that our legislators take when they, with all these bills, with all this backlog, with such limited cash resources, they go out and pass bill after bill that has no funding with it. And then they say, well, the governor didn't sign it, so isn't he a bad guy? Well, the governor didn't sign it because there's no money to pay for it, and there's just yet another empty promise and adds to the backlog of bills we have. It makes it longer for the people who are in line to get paid. It costs the state money because we pay 1% a month interest on bills that have been in the state for more than 90 days. So it's expensive, it's irresponsible, it makes promises we can't keep. It's the wrong thing to do. So just to, just to $100 in your checking account, $8,000 in bills on the table, $1,500 in bills in the mailbox, and $116,000 in credit card debt, make the math work. Uh, you Is can't that, make the right, math no, no, work. Right, right, I mean, right. That's yeah. the problem. You can't make it work. You And we have $100 today. Tomorrow we'll have another 100 The next day we might have 80 or 50 On average, we bring in between 80 and $100 million every single day into the state. But you can't make the math work. Um, it, it's really why we need to do things differently going forward. We can't even raise taxes enough anymore to get out of this mess. Um, taxes would have to go so high that, A, no one would vote for it on either side of the aisle, but B, no one would stay here. Well, for right. Long. I mean, if you can come up with an equa uh, with a, a solution to that equation, then you deserve a Nobel Prize in mathematics. <laughs> but, um, but the other problem that you have, or the other challenge you have, uh, as I understand it, is you're a bit constrained in terms of rank order of priority based on judicial decrees as to uh, who and who shall get paid for what services provided. So explain that piece of it too, because it kind of further limits your latitude right. and your uh, you know, op options for decision making. We, um, since we ran our state for most of last year, for all of last year without a budget, and really our stopgap provides some 
uh, some ability to make payments, but we're still paying a lot under court orders. We're running it under court orders, consent decrees, various continuing appropriations by the legislature. We um, have a lot of things that have to be paid on certain timetables. First and foremost, we make payments on our debt. We know when those are, so we don't default on Illinois bonds, which would be catastrophic if we did that. We have to make Medicaid payments within a certain period of time in order for the state to qualify for the um, nearly 50% match that we get back from the federal government. Those Medicaid bills are about usually a billion dollars, roughly, or more. And so it takes us days to save up cash to, in order to make those Medicaid payments. Then we make the full payment. We get a portion back several days later from the government. Then we can redeploy those funds into something else. We have court orders for various social services, like developmentally disabled that have specific pay dates we need to comply with. And, and there's just a whole host of things that we have to operate within. And then we have, we put everybody else in line and try to follow a first in and first out bill payment methodology. But we have social service organizations all around the state that have waited, it really can't wait anymore. They're closing, they're shuttering services, they're laying off people, they can't meet their payroll. Uh, now we have some that have not been paid all year. And so we, we prioritize those payments and we tell them to give us a call when they get to a point where they can no longer meet their payroll or can't, are about to close something down. And we'll, we'll get them some money. We'll, we go through the big pile of vouchers we have, we find something we can pay and we expedite those funds out to try and keep those services going. Um, oh, and the other thing I forgot to mention is we have, we have um, general state aid payments for our schools that are big payments that also have to go out on the 10th and 20th every month. So there's a lot of constraints about what have to be paid, and we just try to cash manage uh, that small amount of money to get as many things paid as we can as quickly as we can given all the constraints. And it seems to me part of the challenge that you have, that the governor has, that members of the General Assembly have, is communicating to a public that um, sometimes doesn't see the intersection between state government and their lives. It was really interesting, it's the survey research that came out during the budget impasse right up until the stopgap was agreed to and passed and signed by the governor. 60% of Illinoisans said they weren't impacted by the state budget impasse. Now, they're, they're, most of those people are wrong. They're impacted indirectly, but they're impacted in a way that's very much like the withholding system for federal income taxes. You don't kind of really see it. It's not put between your eyes mm -hmm. unless you rely on services from a, a, a because you have a, a family member with developmental disabilities or you rely on the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. um, when it was the potential of schools not opening on time, or at least some schools, now all of a sudden a lot more people started to say, well, maybe I will be directly impacted. But but the, the challenge of communicating the indirect impacts of the financial picture that you just painted if you're not directly accessing state services. Right. It's very challenging. And that's why I spend a lot of my time going out and talking to groups all over uh, uh, all over the state. I talk to municipal groups. I talk to chambers. A lot of businesses feel some of the challenges. Um, honestly, even if they're not directed, um, impact, directly impacted every single day, uh, because People who might work for them uh, have issues with some of their child care. So, so some of the things right. that have, have impacted actually a broader uh, group than you think. And the other group that actually is fairly new this year that a lot of people spoke up about was the higher education lack of funding, where many people in the state have kids who are going to some of these colleges that are having difficulties. All of them have been very vocal about the lack of state funding. And I think it's really raising everyone's... Uh, well, and, and part of it needs to be, you know, perhaps a little bit of an adult conversation to say, look, we, there's a, a lot of people have been talking about this, the financial state of Illinois for a long time. And y you understand the numbers that I just described. A anybody can understand right. the numbers you described, especially when you translate it into a household setting. You think anybody is getting out of this without feeling some pain? We, we have put ourselves in a position, and uh, I'm a firm believer that people get the representation they deserve. We put ourselves in a position where you can't make the math work anymore. It's not Republican, Democrat. It's you either believe math exists or you believe it's an opinion. And, and that you think you can walk away from this on somebody else's dime unscathed, that's not going to be the case for anybody. Right. Everyone is getting hit. You know, we 
are, are very likely going to have to have a tax increase in the short term, at least, to get out of this mess. I mean, I know it's been something that's been on the table. It's part of the things that governors talked about, at least in the short term, with some reforms. But people are going to see their taxes go up. People in Chicago, the property tax oh, has sure. gone up because of the issues with CPS and pensions, et cetera. Everyone is screaming about that. How do you think we pay for this? We are out of money. We are out of money in the state. We are out of money in Chicago. Um, we're out of money. We can't print money. We can't go bankrupt as a state. We have to pay for this. And everybody, I think, is beginning finally to wake up and see the, the, the whole financial situa situation of the state is really a house of cards and that we must begin to bring some fiscal discipline back in. We have to have a balanced budget. We have to stop spending more money than we have. And so the stopgap budget, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You know that it's $8 billion round numbers in unpaid bills right now, tracking to, to bubble back up to $10 billion despite the stopgap budget. Now, uh, Governor Rauner, to his credit, wasn't running around saying this is a big victory. This mm -hmm. was a way for him to essentially provide some short-term relief to the captives until he can change out some of their captors, I think, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with re respect to opening the schools. Um, but people need to understand that because this Band-Aid was passed uh, and you no longer have jawboning between politicians in the headlines, that doesn't mean right after November and frankly every day in between, we're not in the same dire financial right. position. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm glad we passed the stopgap, uh, really for the reason primarily that it gives us the authorization to help catch up the many social service organizations and small businesses, frankly, the, who have provided services uh, for the state. They sign contracts pending a budget. Whoever thought we would be a whole year without a budget? And so it gi gives me the legal authority to release some funds to them and begin to catch them up. It also helps our, our, make sure our schools open on time, right. which should have been disastrous. And um, it helps a little bit higher education, although not nearly enough. But it's not a, it's not a budget that is a long-term budget. And importantly, as I know from my time in business, and I've heard from many of the organizations all around the state, this short-term, six-month stopgap does not give them any certainty, predictability as to what their whole year will look like. It makes it impossible for them to plan and budget for their whole year of what services they can provide. You know, we need some predictability uh, for those organizations that are at any amount reliant on state funding. They need to know how much are they going to get so that they can plan and budget. And they've all said, if, if you're going to cut my budget 20%, I get that. Just let me know so that I can plan yeah. accordingly. And, and we don't do that. And, and that's really what we need to do. We need a balanced budget where we live within our means for everybody, the providers of services and those who need services in the state, the taxpayers who know, so we know what we are um, spending we can actually pay for. Now, I know, obviously, the, as we've spent the focus of our time here talking about this financial house of cards, you have to keep erect. But uh, in addition to that, there are other responsibilities or opportunities for the comptroller's budget. And one of the problems in state government for a long time has been its opacity in operation. Mm -hmm. And even if you put a check register online, well, there's no, there's, there doesn't provide any context for me to understand what the, if the comptroller's office or any other office is, is uh, cutting the right checks mm -hmm. to the right people or not, or what the deal is. And so uh, initiatives in the vein of transparency that help people connect the dots to get a better understanding of state government in a relatively straightforward fashion. Yeah, so we've actually done a lot uh, in the year and a half that I've been in office. We have taken all these transparency tools that so we have, the ledger and the warehouse, where you can look at state funding, um, and we've made those tools much simpler to use, a little bit more app-based, um, and created a much easier way for people to find, the, you know, follow the money in state spending. Um, and next week, we're going to actually announce a new initiative. It's called Open Book, and it is one where it tracks state contracts with uh, with donations. And so people will be able to go online and say, who's getting state contracts and who's getting money from these same mm. people? And so the more I think we can get out there, where is the money going and making it very transparent for people to follow the money, the more likelihood we get, we will have um, better spending choices, um, more accountability for the leaders who are in office that actually control where that money goes. Uh, political question, you're up for election. Mm -hmm in not re-election because you're appointed up right. for your first statewide election in November of this year. You're running against uh, Susanna Mendoza, who was a longtime state legislator, a Chicago Democrat. Now she's the 
city clerk. She's been mostly charged with overseeing the uh, city sticker design mm -hmm, process, mm -hmm. which you know is important to keep it away from gangbangers. I understand the city's had some problems with that, but in terms of setting up the the race between yourself and Miss Mendoza, what's the kind of contrast that you would present and are presenting to voters? What's the question they should be asking themselves when they look down ballot to the comptroller's race and say Munger or Mendoza? Well, hopefully at the highest level, they will look and say, who is there to support me, uh, the people of Illinois versus my political, their political career? Uh, while I am the incumbent, I am pretty new to state politics. I've only been in office a year and a half. My opponent has spent her entire career in politics. Uh, she's never had a regular job. Uh, I come from the business community. I have 25 years of private sector business experience. I have a master's in business. And um, my opponent has an undergrad in business and went right into politics and never looked back. So I think right there, uh, we have a career politician, her, versus me, relatively new. I really tried as my time as comptroller to, to focus on doing a good job as the comptroller and to put people before politics. And um, I'm continuing to try and do that. I have worked very hard to take expenses out of the state that will reduce the cost of taxpayers, that will help free up critical funds that we don't have to help people most in need. Uh, I've done that by cutting my own budget 10%, consolidating departments, cross-training people. I turned a million dollars back to taxpayers at the end of uh, last fiscal year. Our budget this year is 10% less. I am constantly looking for ways to hold budgets flat or, in my own case, reduce budgets instead of having them grow. Um, I'm working with the governor's office to lead an effort to um, change our state financial systems over. They're very, the current ones are extremely old. They're 30 plus years old. They're programmed in COBOL. They are, uh, cost us hundreds of millions of dollars to maintain. We're, we've just finished the first year of a pilot. It's going to take us five years to fully implement the whole project. It saves our state half a billion dollars a year when it's fully implemented and up and running. And importantly, will make it very easy for people to see where we're spending money because there'll be one set of books and we won't have all these different systems. Uh, I put the legislative pay in line. Um, I think it gives everyone an understanding that I don't view myself as any more important in my own salary as everyone else waiting in line for the state and we are all gonna wait in line. And so I think so, those are really some of the things that I've tried to do, um, really bring my business experience to bear, um, try to be a good example and lead solutions, and to, um, and, and to try and do what's right, follow the law and do what's right for the people of Illinois. And I don't think uh, you could say that about my opponent. My opponent, as I mentioned, she spent her career there. She has voted every tax increase, every uh, un- um, um, unfunded pension uh, pension holiday that was taken, uh, every unbalanced budget. She voted for every one of them over 10 years. Her actions are really part of the reason we have all these problems today. Um, so I think if people look, there'll be a very good contrast. Uh, one more political question, uh, and that's, it's a little bit different for you running statewide, and you're the only state constitutional officer running statewide this election cycle. Um, you know, Republicans and Democrats traditionally, at least in part, play this game of regionalism, right? Mm -hmm. And you saw it with the stopgap budget a little bit. Don't bail out Chicago and jawboning Chicago if you're uh, downstate and, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, I, I wonder if as you get around the state, and, and I did when I was a candidate, but, but a lot more people are interested to talk to you than they were when I was a statewide <laughs> candidate. So you probably have a better perspective. But but the, the regional the money. Well, <laughs> what money we have. Yeah. But I mean the regionalism of this idea of, of pitting southern Illinois or even the suburbs versus Chicago, I mean it's not so much the communities, it's more kind of a commentary on the, where the, the politicians are from and who mm -hmm holds the purse strings and the, the levers of power. But I just wonder if you think that at the you know, regular uh, Illinois family level, you know, that regionalism, those regional uh, political formulations are productive, or if they really talk past the issue and at the end of the day, you know, folks in Carbondale aren't all that different than folks in Lincolnshire or the northwest side of Chicago. Um. 
You know, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think in some, when we start talking about school funding, I actually have seen a lot of difference, particularly between the suburbs or the downstate schools versus what CPS has been asking for. There's been a lot of discussion about that. And people say, look, we already spend a lot of our own tax dollars to fund our schools. We get very little from the state as it is. Don't take any more of our money to fund CPS. So I think some of that regionalism seeps in there. That, frankly, is where I've seen most of it. And as the comptroller, I've really tried to just treat everyone fairly evenly. There are social service organizations here in Chicago that do great work for people. Uh, I was just in a run with, uh, John and I were in a run with our dogs actually last Sunday for a safe haven. Wonderful organization. Uh, Helps a lot of people, really turns their lives around. And uh, I've been to organizations down in East St. Louis, same kind of Leslie Bates Davis House, same kind of place, or up in Rockford. And so, uh, I really try to get all around the state and meet with organizations and try to be a help no matter where they're from um, and try to help people, businesses, no matter where they're from. Um, I think the average person in Illinois just wants our state to run well. They want to be able to have their kids get jobs here. They want to send their kids to school and know they're going to open on time. They want their kids to go to college and not be feared that their university is going to go out of business. Um, I, I think they're more concerned in total about just the lack of accountability. She is Illinois State Comptroller Leslie Munger, our guest on this edition of Against the Current. Leslie, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate your time.